Welcome to Seeking Truth Catholic Bible Study and to our series on the Gospel of John. You can find us at SeekingTruth.net. Please join us now for Seeking Truth with Sharon Doran. Welcome to Seeking Truth. This is our overview of John's Gospel. The Gospel of John is what we're studying this year, and I've got a question for you. Why did you come tonight? Why are you here? <laughs> did your wife make you come? Did your husband say you gotta go with me to this? To his wife? The Gospel of John holds wonderful treasures for us this year. And John actually tells us the purpose of his gospel. He tells us why he wrote this book. This is his own words. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. That is why John wrote this. Number one, that you may believe that he's Messiah, Son of God, this Jesus, and that you might have life. <laughs> and not just puny life. Because he tells us in, in chapter 10, Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I looked up abundant, plentiful, copious, profuse, rich, lavish life, bumper life, overflowing, abounding, generous, bountiful, huge, great, prolific, teeming life. That's what he wants you to have this year. Abundant life, everlasting life, eternal life in him. The life we were created for from the beginning. A life in full communion with the Trinity like they were back in the garden. John revealed a glimpse of that to us last year in our study of Revelation. John, the same author, John. John, the son of his father Zebedee and his mother Salami. Some Orthodox writings say that John was the son of Zebedee and Solomi was the daughter of St. Joseph who was remarried to the Virgin Mary. Isn't that interesting? Joseph, uh, some theories are that Joseph may have been older and he might have been a widow and he might have had children by another marriage before his betrothal to the Virgin Mary. And so in Mark 6, 3, we read, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. This could be part of the way of that kin relation through his mother, his stepmother. <laughs> Salami married Zebedee and became the mother of the apostles James and John and her feast day we just celebrated August 3rd. She saw the death of Jesus. She was there. She was one of the myrrh-bearing women who brought spices on the resurrection morning. There she is, one of the myrrh-bearing women, the mother of John. And Jesus had a conversation with her in Matthew 20 when Jesus said to her, what do you want? And she said, declare that these two sons of mine, one sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Now that's a lot to ask. That's a good Jewish mother, right? <laughs> Jesus called them the sons of thunder, these brothers, James and John. When Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> Are they able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they said, oh, yes, we are. We're able. We're ready. And he said, you will indeed drink the cup. But to sit at my right hand and my left hand are not mine to grant. This is for whom it has been prepared by my father. Father's top authority. Father's top dog. Sons of thunder, James and John, did drink the cup. And I'll tell you what I mean. James drank the cup first. He was the first apostle to... <coughs> Herod Antipas had him beheaded in Acts chapter 12. He drank the cup. Jesus said, you will indeed drink my cup. Now, when Jesus commissioned the disciples at the very last chapter of Mark 16, he says a couple things. He says that you apostles are going to pick up snakes in your hands 
And if you drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. Well, that came true. We see St. Paul on the island of Malta. He picks up a deadly viper and all the natives think, oh, he's going to die. And he shakes it off and he's not harmed. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. How many paintings have you seen when St. John the Evangelist has a serpent coming out of his cup? It's written later, tradition, little t, that John was given a cup of poison to drink. This was in the persecutions um, when Christians were being killed. Before drinking, John blessed the cup and poison departed from the cup in the form of a serpent. So you'll see many paintings with a snake coming out of the cup of John. Here's an El Greco. So when you see that, you'll know why. John would indeed drink the cup. It was later written that John emerged unharmed from a cauldron of boiling oil, which he had been thrown into from his torturers. And there are paintings of that, St. John the Beloved being boiled in oil. John the Evangelist in a vat of boiling oil. John in boiling oil. Did it hurt him? Many came to believe by John's witness he was unharmed. Now Peter was concerned about what type of death is John going to die? These three, Peter, James, and John, they were in the inner circle. What, he was really wondering, what kind, how, what, what kind of death is John going to have? And Peter said to Jesus in John 21, Lord, what about him? What about John? And Jesus said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, until I return, until I come back, what's that to you, Peter? You follow me. So the rumor spread throughout the whole community that this disciple, John, was not going to die. And Jesus didn't say that he would not die, but he said, if it is my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? There is a tomb of John in Ephesus, John the Beloved. He died around the year 100 AD. After 313 AD, the Emperor Constantine ended anti-Christian persecution in the Roman Empire, and the Ephesians at Ephesus built a tomb over, uh, chapel over John's tomb. But when Constantine had that opened, there was no body, and there were no relics of John found in 313. In the 5th century, Emperor Justinian uh, replaced the chapel with a grand basilica in the honor of St. John. Later, that area was conquered by the Turks. The Basilica of John was converted to a mosque and destroyed by Tamerlane in 1402. Here's the ruins of the Basilica. You can still see them today, the Basilica of St. John, see the cross. But when they exhumed the tomb there, it was empty. No one knows what became of John's body. Mark Zusick wrote a short history of St. John in Ephesus, and he said that John was preaching as normal, but he informed his disciples of his time one Sunday. John entered the cave of his church, whereupon an intense light shone, preventing his disciples from entering farther. When the light dissipated, so did John. So many in this part of the world believe John was assumed. There is a tombstone that just says St. Jean in Mesere, in memory of. His body's not there. No relics are there. No city has claimed to have his relics. No church has claimed to have his relics. Now that's very unusual because when you go to Rome, uh, St. John the Baptist, for instance, we've got his head, well, we've got his foot, well, we've got his arm, you know, people claim parts of the saint. No one claims to have John the Beloved. Very interesting. Some things we do know from scripture. Uh, John's the youngest of the apostles. And in paintings and artwork, we see him with very uh, young features, no facial hair. He usually is dressed in green and uh, red in art. And he is the only one not martyred of the apostles other than Judas Iscariot who took his own life. All the rest will be martyred except for John. This is John, the inner circle, who Jesus invited to come in and I witnessed the resurrection of Jairus' daughter, who was 12 years old, which was probably about the same age, perhaps, as John. This is John, who Jesus invited to Mount Tabor to see him in his glory transfigured. 
And John was an eyewitness to this event, yet he did not record it in his gospel. All three of the synoptics did, not John. No record. This is John who finished, uh, Jesus invited him to come deeper into the Garden of Agony to pray with him deeper in the garden that night. This is John, the beloved disciple who laid his head on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper, the mystical Last Supper. John reclined on the breast of our Lord. This is John who stayed with Mary at the foot of the cross, the only apostle who stayed during the crucifixion. This is John who took Mary into his care as commanded in a dying wish from Jesus on the cross. This is John who ran faster than Peter when they were told that the tomb was empty on Easter morning. And John's the one that wants to make sure we know that. John ran faster. <laughs> Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed and Mary Magdalene ran to tell Peter and John. It's in John's gospel. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, John wrote that about himself. <laughs> he knows Jesus loves him. He's confident of his love. He said to them, they've taken, she said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and, and we do not know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple, John, set out and went toward the tomb and the two were running together again. But the other disciple, John, outran Peter and he reached the tomb first. And he bent down to look in and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following. He went to the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place all by itself. A detail only told by John. Then the other disciple, John, who reached the tomb first, again, also went in. And he saw and he believed. That's John's own word. He saw that the tomb was empty. He didn't know it needed to see anything else. He believed Jesus is risen from the dead. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. John believed without the Holy Spirit because they won't get the Holy Spirit for a while. And John believed there on the spot when he saw the empty tomb, John believed. John knows that he is loved by Jesus. John deferred to Peter, the prince of the apostles, who Jesus made the rock. He waited. He did not go in before his elder. John believed, even without the descent of the Holy Spirit, he believed, he believed. And he knew he needed the Holy Spirit to understand more, to unlock all the mysteries. We all need the Holy Spirit to understand more. It's a gift you got at confirmation. It's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, understanding, knowledge, wisdom. There will be a private Pentecost only recorded by John in John 20 for the 10 apostles present. Judas is not there and Thomas was not there that night, but Jesus came through the locked doors. Again, John will receive the Holy Spirit on Pentecost with the 120, and he would understand about the Holy Spirit in great detail. We know that because he writes about it more than any other gospel. John tells us about the promise of the Holy Spirit in chapter 14. He tells us about the work of the Holy Spirit in chapter 16 in great detail. He understands it. He gets it. It's amazing. They're hard chapters. He has a high Christology. He tells us the high priestly prayer that Jesus prayed for all his disciples. He's the only one that tells us that. John is one of the four living creatures in the New Testament. He's a gospel. This is a gospel, the words of Christ himself recorded by John. Now you know about the four living creatures. We had them in Exodus, in Moses. We studied the four Remember the four living creatures and they, they surround what? What's in the center? The true presence of God. Yes, in the tent of the meeting. We, we studied it last year in Ezekiel. In the throne room of God where the true presence of God is, what surrounds the true presence of God? The four living creatures. We saw it in Revelation last year in the throne room of heaven. Several times in Revelation, we saw the four living creatures around the throne of God. Always surrounding the true presence of God. Look here. What do you see? 
on the word of God, the four living creatures. Why? Because the scriptures are the true presence of God. This is the word of God, the word that was made flesh. The word is Jesus. There's the four living creatures. This is my church, St. Margaret Mary's. The four living creatures surround the true presence of God. He's there in the tabernacle in the Eucharist. The same symbols. And of those, John is the eagle. Why? His thoughts are lofty. His thoughts soar. His theology soars. It's mystical. It's spiritual. Remember last year in Revelation 12, her birthday tonight, the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness. John, the great eagle, took her to Ephesus where she would be safe. Mary's home was in Ephesus. You can go there today. It's a place where Muslims go, where Christians go, where Jews go. John was a contemplative mystic. He cared for Mary in her final years, and he has very high Christology. There are 73 Catholic biblical books in your Bible. If you have a Catholic Bible. If you have a Protestant, six will be taken out. Seven will be removed. But 46 are Old Testament books. 27 are New Testament books. Five of the 27 are authored by John. John, his gospel, the book of Revelation, and his three epistles. St. Anastasius in 367 AD gave this list of 27 books of the New Testament and said these are the sources of salvation for the thirsty may drink deeply of the words to be found here. In these alone is the doctrine of piety recorded. Let no one add to them or take anything away from them. And then three church councils in a row confirmed those 27 books of the New Testament, five written by John. We're going to study his gospel this year. The gospels hold a primary place in the Catholic Church. Our catechism says the four gospels occupy a central place because Jesus Christ is their center. The gospels are the heart of all the scriptures because they are the principal source for the life and teaching of the incarnate word, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The gospels are important. John's important because at mass we sing hallelujah before the gospel, right? We, we, we hail this. We, we're going to hear the kerygma. Right now we're going to hear Jesus. So we sing hallelujah and we all stand up and we belt it out, right? I hope you do. We sing a special hallelujah before the gospel is proclaimed at mass. We stand up out of reverence, out of awe, out of respect for the words of Christ, the living word. The gospel is sometimes incensed on high holy days. The gospel is venerated. It's kissed. Here's what Dave Verbum says. This is a Vatican II document that says the church has always venerated the divine scriptures just as she has venerated the body of the Lord. Since especially in the sacred liturgy, she unceasingly receives and offers to the faithful the bread of life from the table of both. The bread of life from both God's word and Christ's body. Your Bible is precious. Don't throw it on the couch. This is the word of God. We venerate both. We eat from both of these tables. Both are Jesus, God's word and God's body. Only the ordained can read the gospel at mass. You must be an ordained priest or an ordained minister to proclaim the gospel. It's important. The gospel's Jesus, just as the Eucharist is Jesus. De Verbum goes on to say she, the church, has always maintained them, always maintained the scriptures, and she continues to do so together with sacred tradition as the supreme rule of faith, since as inspired by God, they committed once and for all to writing, they, the scriptures, impart the word of God himself without change. The scriptures are important to Catholics. They're the supreme rule of our faith. They're inspired by God. They're committed once and for all to writing. You have all the revelation right there in the palm of your hand. They make the voice of the Holy Spirit resound in the words of the prophets and the apostles. Therefore, like the Christian religion itself, all the preaching of the church must be nourished and regulated by sacred scripture. Did you catch that? 
All the preaching of the church must be regulated by sacred scripture. It's important that we're here. It's important that we study this. It's important that we fall in love with this. This is Jesus. If you think the Catholic church is not a Bible church, you are wrong. All three of our last popes have implored the faithful, please read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. This is bunk that the church doesn't want Catholics to read the Bible. That's, that's no. These have begged us to read the Bible. There's a new series called UCAT. It was introduced at World Youth Day 211 by Cardinal Christopher Schonberg of Vienna. And it's, it's for the youth. It's the youth catechism. They have DUCAT, which is Catholic social teaching. They have just come out with a new UCAT Bible. And it's only in German right now. It's not even in English yet, but I want to read you the prologue because it's from our Holy Father, Pope Francis. He wrote the prologue for the German edition and it applies to all of us. This is what he said. My dear young friends, if you could see my Bible, you would not be particularly impressed. What, that's the Pope's Bible? Such an old worn out book? You could buy me a new one for $1,000, but I wouldn't want it. I love my old Bible, which has accompanied me half of my life. It's been with me in times of joy and times of tears. It is my most precious treasure. I live out of it. I live out of it. And I wouldn't give anything in the world for it. I really like this new youth Bible. It's so colorful. It's rich in testimonies, testimonies of saints, testimonies of young people. It's so inviting that when you start to read it at the beginning, you can't stop until the last page. And then... And then it disappears on a shelf and collects dust. And your children find it one day and bring it to the flea market. <laughs> it must not come to that. It must not come to that. I tell you something. There are more persecuted Christians in the world today than in the earliest days of the church. Why are they persecuted? They're persecuted because they wear a cross and they bear witness to Jesus. They're convicted because they own a Bible. The Bible is therefore a highly dangerous book. So dangerous that if you're treated in some countries that, like you're hiding hand grenades in your closet, if you have a Bible. Then the Pope says this. It was a non-Christian, Mahatma Gandhi, who once said, you Christians, look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all salvation to or civilization to pieces, to turn the world upside down and to bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as though it were nothing more than a piece of literature. So what do you have in your hands? A piece of literature? Some nice old stories? Then you would have to say to the many Christians who go to prison or are tortured because they own a Bible, oh, how foolish you are, it's just a piece of literature. No, <laughs> by the word of God has light come into the world and it will never go out. I said in Evangelii Gaudium, we do not blindly seek God or wait for him to speak to us first, for God has already spoken and there's nothing further that we need to know which has not been revealed to us. Let us receive the sublime treasure of the revealed word. You have something divine in your hands, a book like fire, a book with, through which God speaks. So notice the Bible is not meant to be placed on a shelf, but to be put in your hands, to read often every day both on your own and together with others. So you have something divine in your hands? You do sports together, you go shopping together. Why not read the Bible together, two, three, four of you? In nature, in the woods, on the beach, at night, in the glow of a few candles, you'll have a great experience. Or are you afraid of making a fool of yourself in front of others? And I ask that question to you because I've had several people tell me, I don't want to take a Bible study because I don't know anything about the Bible and I don't want to look stupid. The Pope says, are you afraid of making a fool of yourself in front of others? Read the Bible with attention. Do not stay on the surface as if reading a comic book, just skimming over. Never skim over the word of God. Ask yourself, what does this say to my heart? Does God speak through these words to me? Has he touched me in the depths of my longing? What should I do? Only in this way can the force of the word of God unfold. Only in this way can it change our lives, making them great and beautiful. I want to tell you how I read my old Bible. Often, I read a little, then I put it away, and I contemplate the Lord. Not that I see the Lord, but he looks at me. He's there. I let myself look at him. 
and I feel, this is not sentimentality. I feel deeply the things that the Lord tells me. Sometimes he does not speak. I feel nothing, only emptiness, emptiness, emptiness. But I remain patiently, and so I wait, reading and praying. I pray sitting because it hurts to kneel. Sometimes I even fall asleep while I'm praying, but it doesn't matter. I'm like a son with the Father. That's what's important. Would you like to make me happy? <laughs> then read your Bible, Pope Francis. Is that not the most beautiful prologue for all of us? Why we should read the Bible? We're going to do that this year, and we're going to read the Gospel of John, and we're going to do it together. Now, the synoptic gospel, sin, optic, means see together. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they see together. John does not belong to the synoptics. John has a bird's eye view. John soars like an eagle above everything. In Matthew chapter 1, here's how he begins his gospel. The royal genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah from David to Abraham. Luke, the birth of John the Baptist foretold. Mark, the proclamation of John the Baptist, the voice crying out in the wilderness, fulfilling Isaiah. But John is different. John offers a unique beginning to his gospel. It is beauty, beauty, beauty. A supernatural truth and beauty that comes through his prologue. He hails all the way back to Genesis with these three words, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created. Now, St. Augustine said the words of his prologue are so beautiful that these words are worthy of being written in gold and placed in every church around the world. This prologue of John's is so anointed, and we're going to study it next week. In the beginning, God created. In the Gospel of John, God will recreate a new creation. And we're going to be day counters right off the bat. Chapter 2, we'll see a new Adam and a new Eve and a new sacrament and a new covenant. An endless flow of new wine at Cana. It's not just any old wine. It's the finest wine you've ever tasted. It's Eucharistic wine, and it never runs out, and it's a new covenant on the seventh day in John's Gospel. And we're not told the name of the groom at this wedding, but John knows who the groom is. It's a secret bridegroom, and his name is Jesus, and it's going to be a secret all throughout John's gospel, and we'll point it out when we, when we see Jesus as bridegroom. Jesus the bridegroom is one of John's major hidden themes. Beautiful. He's the eternal bridegroom. He has endless wine that nobody knows about yet because the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. But look at this, I am the vine, you are the branches, thus the, where he was pierced in the side is a sprout of the vine coming out around the cross, the new tree of life, and he's squeezing the eternal <laughs> Eucharistic wine from the grapes. They will know about it when the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost and descends over them and enlightens their minds and increases their understanding of these mysteries. John unveiled the bride of Christ for us last year in the book of Revelation. Beautiful. The spirit and the bride, the church, say come. Let everyone who hears say come. Let everyone who's thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift come. Jesus is going to offer that same water, that same spirit, that same gift to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Only John has it. If you knew the gift of God and he who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The climax of the prologue is at verse 14 where it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word became flesh. He made his dwelling among us. He tented with us. The true presence of God tented with us. What was in the tent? The true presence of God. The tent of the meeting, he now made his tent among us. The flesh started at the moment 
of conception by the power of the Holy Spirit when Mary was overshadowed and Mary's body became a new tent of the meeting. Mary's body was the tent that was meeting the true presence of God and her womb became the new ark of a new covenant. What has to be in the ark? We learned that in Hebrews 9. The ark of the covenant, there has to be the golden urn holding the manna, check, Jesus is the bread of life, the new manna, the heavenly manna. Aaron's rod that budded, check. Jesus is supreme authority. He gets it directly from the Father. It goes to Jesus, to the apostles, apostolic authority. And the ta tablets of the covenant, the law. And Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Overshadowed by cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. He himself is mercy. The fruit of her womb became the word of God made flesh. And John's gonna tell us, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life within you. And they said, what? This man speaks harshly. Who can listen to this? Who can understand this? And some did not understand. And many left Jesus that day, many. The, in, the eternal temptation is to not trust God's word. What did God say, eat my flesh? He can't mean that. Yes, he does. <laughs> they, they didn't trust God's word. And when you don't trust God's word, there's no reason to obey it because I don't trust it anyway. Why should I obey it? It's the eternal thing that happened in the garden. With Adam and Eve, they didn't trust God's word. So they didn't obey. All the way through the Bible, trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey. And Jesus says to them, what are you guys going to do? Are you going to leave? And Peter says, Lord, to whom else can we go? You have the words of everlasting life. Ding, 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 ding. Good answer, Peter, because he is the word of everlasting life. He's the word. And Peter trusts that he doesn't understand it. They don't have the Holy Spirit yet. They can't understand it. They don't know, but he's got the word of everlasting life. Let's go with it. He's the word. Peter trusts, and he tries to obey, and he does pretty good, and he falls. John's gospel will be extremely Eucharistic and extremely sacramental. We're going to find so many sacraments in this gospel, starting with that, the sacrament of Holy Communion, endless wine, <laughs> and endless bread, the multiplication of the loaves, endless, endless, endless. We'll learn about baptism with Nick at night, the only one that tells us that story. You have to be born of water in the spirit. Same thing he tells the woman at the well to drink from the living water. Confirmation, baptism. In chapter 20 of John, Jesus enters through those locked doors to the upper room and he breathes on them. Not everybody, just 10 men who were his closest apostles that he hand chose after praying to the Father. And he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. And when he breathes, there's droplets of water in his breath and the Spirit of God is water and spirit and he recreates a new priesthood. This is a sacrament of holy orders that used to be a Levitical priesthood, not anymore. Jesus isn't even a Levite and neither are they. He's recreating the priesthood the Levitical priesthood was always, all the way through the Old Testament, we've traced that so many times, it's always the way to atone for sin by the blood. And we learned in Hebrews that his blood is, is effective. His blood is the final sacrifice. He is the high priest. He is the victim also. He's the priest and victim and the final prophet. He's everything. His blood did it once for all. This is going to be a new priesthood. He recreated with water and spirit and breathed the Holy Spirit onto this new priesthood. And he gave them the power and the authority to do something that only, 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 only God can do. Forgive sin. He told them they had the power to forgive sin. And this is the reason Jesus Christ got crucified. Why? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said things to people like, stand up and walk. Your sins are forgiven you. 
And he did. He stood up and walked. How can he forgive? Only God can forgive. This man is guilty of blasphemy. He must be killed. Now he's telling them to do it. He's giving them the authority from the Father to him to them, the risen Christ, walking through locked doors and giving them the authority to forgive sin. If you forgive the sin of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. He didn't say that to everybody. I can go straight to Jesus. No, he said this to a priesthood that he was recreating. It's the sacrament of reconciliation and it comes through a priesthood. This is how God planned it from the beginning of time. There's a precursor for that in the upper room. John's the only one that has this. When he washed his feet the night of the Last Supper. Peter doesn't want his feet washed by Jesus. He said, you'll never wash my feet, Lord. And Jesus said, Peter, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, well, Lord, then not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet. Huh. Well, you are bathed when you're baptized. Original sin is removed. Did you ever sin again since your infant baptism? Anybody? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying. You got dirty feet. They need to be washed. It doesn't mean you never sinned again. He made provision for that in his priesthood. We have dirty feet because we live in a fallen, sinful, wounded world. It's disordered. It's all get out. But we can go to confession for foot washing time and time and time again, daily if needed. Mother Teresa went all the time. Just as Jesus Christ set it up through a priesthood. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set an example that you should do as I have done to you. They don't get it now because they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. But when he breathes on them the Holy Spirit in their own private Pentecost, and then when he wham wallops them again with the 120 on Pentecost Sunday, they're going to have plenty of the Holy Spirit to understand. Very, very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one of them, one of my priests, receives me. Because they're in persona Christi. They're in person of me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. Because I take my orders from the Father. Get it? It all makes sense. But you have to have eyes to see. These are mysteries. How about holy matrimony? The bride and bridegroom nuptial theme runs all the way through John's gospel, all the way through Revelation. The marriage of Jesus and his bride, the church, is consummated on the cross. Consummation is painful. The church is conceived to bear eternal fruit from the true mother of all the living. The church will be birthed at Pentecost with another overshadowing of the Holy Spirit and a recapitulation. It all starts over again through the church. The life of Christ carries on in the communion of the body of Christ and the saints. The tent of the meeting, he makes us a tent of the meeting inside our bodies. Paul says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God and you're not your own? So you become a tent of the meeting. All because the word became made flesh and made his dwelling among us and within us. The true presence. We eat him. He told us to. We trust him. We become partakers of his divinity. Peter tells us that. Unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. The eternal temptation is not to trust God's word. Well, he didn't really mean that. Do you trust God's word? Do you really trust God's word? It's the eternal pitfall. Do you obey God's word? So you have to trust it first. Before You're not going to obey something you don't trust. John obeyed him. John trusted him from when he was young to when he was an old, old man. This book has seven signs. 
Six of the seven will be in the first 11 chapter, and each sign tells you something of who Jesus is. And he writes it so that we would believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah and that we'd have life in his name. There are seven, 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 perfection, fulfillment, perfection, fulfillment, covenant, you know it. And there's seven great I am statements. The synoptics take us through one Passover with Jesus. John will take us through three Passovers. And the final Passover, Jesus himself, will be the Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of God. He knew it from the first time he saw him. Next week. A turning point in John's gospel at chapter 12. A huge turning point. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If I die, and then I will rise, and then I will sow, and and it'll be you and you and you and you and you. The body of Christ will be all over the world. I will live in you. You will be Jesus to other people. Jesus had to die. The book of signs will turn into the book of glory. The theme of the hour and day counting, watch for that. Watch for the contrast of light and dark. Watch for irony. John is the king of irony. Stories unique only to John, like the woman caught in adultery and the compassion of Jesus. Only John will record the raising of Lazarus from the dead. That's a biggie. Only John has it. Only John has the invitation for Thomas to stick his hand inside his wounds, the wounds of Christ. John has the great account of the passion where Pilate is struggling to understand truth when truth itself is standing right in front of him. What is truth? And of course, John's amazing bread of life discord, his unique institution of the Eucharist in John 6. Last year, Ezekiel and Revelation both said the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. Jesus is the tree of life. John knows it. My last thing. I'm going to read you something from the catechism, but I put pictures with it because I loved it so much. Catechism 2837. The Father in heaven urges us. This is all about the bread of life. The Father in heaven urges us as children of heaven to ask for the bread of heaven. Christ himself is the bread who was sown in the virgin, who was raised up in the flesh, who was kneaded in the passion, who was baked in the oven of the tomb, who was reserved in Catholic churches, who is brought to the altars and furnishes the faithful each day with food from heaven, the bread of angels, the bread from heaven, the medicine of immortality, viaticum, food for the journey. Let's pray. Father God, we praise and thank you for this study this year of your apostle John the Beloved, the one who laid his head on your breast at the Last Supper, the one who loved you, the one who you loved. John, will you intercede for us this year as you guide us through this inspired work of the Holy Spirit written at your hand? Mary, who was entrusted to John. Will you pray for us as we come to know better the word that you bore, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, lover of our souls, breath of God, will you stir up the flame in us that we hunger for this water of life that you want to drench us with this year. We praise and thank you and give all glory to the Trinity. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Seeking Truth Catholic Bible Study. For more information, please go to seekingtruth.net.